Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to a virtual edition of our AI symposium. This is our kickoff session, and we're going to be spending some time today talking about what works and what doesn't work in AI adoption. It's about about two-ish years, maybe a little less than that, since the Gen AI sort of exciting craze took off. But does it even feel like the holy cow um, that it's been almost that amount of time? And I'm really excited to talk about what we've seen be successful and what we've seen not be successful so you can learn from that in your own AI adoption journeys and how you lead your organizations. And, and to do that, I'm gonna start by just introducing myself. So my name is Nathan Lesnowski. I am Concurrency's Chief Technology Officer. I have spent the last uh, 23 years in consulting. I've been with con Concurrency for a long, long time. And especially over the last several years, have spent time with over 70 executive teams, helping them navigate the adoption of AI within the context of their organization. And it's been a huge blessing to do that because, man, what have you ever seen a time where you've really been able to get to the heart of what an organization does, where, where the executive team has thought of technology as an asset for them and really challenged the IT organization and the rest of the organization to use technology to make them better. And some of those organizations have harnessed AI and leveraged it to, in a, to a way that's really helped them to change and engage the mission of their business. And other ones, they've, get, they've gotten going and then maybe they've sputtered out or they haven't put the energy into it. And I'm really looking forward to sharing what has differentiated those companies uh, in this conversation today. That is my QR code. Um, so if you would love to uh, scan that, I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn. So I'm super active on LinkedIn. I have a weekly newsletter on AI leadership there's about 20 something um, past uh, newsletter assets that you can take advantage of. I think you'd really find value in uh, in following that content and taking advantage of that content. I, I produce it on a regular basis for you to take advantage of. So please connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, get that content, follow me. I'd love for you to be able to take advantage of it. Nice to meet everyone today. OK, so what are we doing in this session? First, what we're going to do is talk about what successful AI adoption looks like. What's it, what's it look like? What's it smell like? What does it feel like? How do I know if I'm doing it well? Uh, we're going to talk about what uh, that adoption looks like. And then we're going to go into a little bit of an AB, um, AB of what works and what doesn't work. And then we're going to talk about how to take action on some of those ideas. A few things I'd love for you to do. I'm going to, uh, I'm a one man band on this call, but I'm going to do my best to be watching the chat. I would love for you to be uh, putting your questions in the chat. I will do my best to answer those questions. If not throughout the session, I will make sure to reserve some time at the end for us to answer them. So liberally use that uh, Q&A feature in the context of the session. I'd love to uh, just kind of get your reaction and get questions that you have as we, as we go throughout. Um, so I'll do my best on that. Okay. Hey, we have some people who can't see the screen, but I don't know, sometimes restarting or joining in a certain <laughs> way. I have people who can see it and people who can't see it. So um, this is okay. getting recorded. Uh, if you want to reshow it, share it, hopefully it'll help. Will do. Thank you for, for saying that. Well, that's, look, this was actually a test. This was a <laughs> test of our, um, our broadcast system. I'm just going to like full screen mode. Hopefully okay. this gives you uh, gives you that ability to see my screen without any interruption. That looking okay. good there, Amy? It's looking good for me. If other people can't see it, maybe restart your Teams instance, but it's, it's showing up well for me. Hopefully this helps. Thank you so much. OK, thanks. OK, I'm glad we did that before I made this point. So if you leave this session with only one thing to bring back to your business, I want you to remember this sentence. Successful AI adoption is about actualizing the mission of your business. Now that may seem obvious, but it's not obvious to many organizations as they've gone down the path. Successful AI adoption is about actualizing the mission of your business, and it starts with understanding what the mission of your business is, being able to translate that into strategic objectives that you probably already have, and then thinking about technology as an asset to make that true. In it is an opportunity for us to be able to use a, a technology which is an enabling technology. Think about this as like, 
a light bulb moment, the electricity moment, maybe even closer to electricity than light bulb, right? The internet, you know, you, if you thought a smartphone, if you thought about these moments where like these technologies became a thing, how long did it take us to really realize and actualize the internet? How long did it take us to real, really realize and actualize electricity? or even the smartphone. There was a period where we knew it existed, but it really didn't hit our social consciousness because it was the enabling technology that made other things true. AI is like that, except it's moving a lot faster. So it's an enabling technology. It's changing the game. It's enabling our organizations to think about something differently, but you have to understand the mission of your business and how it relates to that rather than necessarily looking at it the other way around. So this is a starting point for and how they've made this journey and how they've enabled that culture of experimentation, but done so in the context of actualizing the mission of the business. So the challenge I would have for you, and I'm going to go through some examples of this, is been a year and a half. What have you achieved with AI? What, what have you achieved in your organization? You meaning like your organization. What has it achieved? Has it achieved anything? Has it achieved Small things. Has it achieved something really significant? Maybe you did something even before the sort of chat GPT moment. Maybe you've been engaged in traditional ML for a long time and you've seen those, those results already as a, at, before even getting to this moment and you've force multiplied it through this swing. Here's some examples of what other organizations have achieved during that same period. So if you said it's been a year and a half, what have you achieved? Have you increased revenue for your business by winning more deals? Truly think about it that way. If I've applied AI, whether it's at the commodity level and the way that like my, my individual team members are leveraging something like a co-pilot or a tool that helps them to be able to accelerate their work product, or it's a auto quoting engine that we've created, am I winning more deals because I'm able to bring those deals to my customers faster and more accurate way that outcompetes my competitors? Or have I not done that? And I'm still about where I was yesterday. Am I able to ease frustration in my customer experience by applying AI? There's a, a recent study that um, over 90% of businesses that were surveyed are looking at AI to optimize their customer experience. A small percentage have, but most are looking at it as an opportunity for that. Why? Because we want to reduce the amount of time that our customers are sitting in that unhappy state. If I can take a customer that's unhappy because of either they don't have a question, they're not sure how to use a product, maybe their product's broken, or they're, they have a question about like downstream activities within the context of something they're working with us on, how can I ease that frustration faster for them, put them in a, in a happy state more quickly? Many of our companies we've worked with have used AI to be able to arm the customer service teams or arm their direct customers with answers to their questions or even opportunities for them to be able to take action based upon something that they know. Have you reduced inventory carrying costs by driving efficiency through the supply chain? This happens to be one of the older uses of AI, um, even pre-chat GPT moment, but it's one of the most powerful. Can I optimize what really is my supply chain? Can I optimize how much product or staff I'm applying to a particular scenario in a particular location with particular skills or qualities to be able to optimize my costs at any given moment. Tremendous opportunity, tremendous opportunity simply because the dollars here are so tangible. I was talking with an organization and they said, if you could reduce the purchase, the, the price they buy this particular commodity at, at this bulk cost by one cent, you'll save us a million dollars save us a million dollars by driving efficiency of one cent. This is the opportunity that stands before us and many organizations have taken advantage of. I worked with an organization, they save $40 million a year. They're about a billion and a half organization. They save $40 million a year of carrying costs because of applying AI. Have I set clear expectations of my customers that are measurably more accurate than before? Can I set expectations such as, here is when your product is being delivered, here is, and when maybe if there's interruption to the supply chain, here's when you can now expect that product to be delivered. Way I think one is, do I have a Domino's pizza tracker? And when there's something wrong, does my Domino's pizza tracker adjust and give my customer service team the ability to, to interact with them? And can I even QA against that in an intuitive customer-centric way? In a way, uh, I'm working with a, 
a company, they're a, a travel agency. Uh, you can follow them on LinkedIn, Fox World Travel. They just went live with a product called Colby. And uh, this product, what it enables them to do is their customers will buy, um, their their customers are other businesses and they will buy travel services, you know, at bulk, right? Like I have a, a thousand people who are going to be flying this year and I want to know what percentage of my flights are going through Southwest versus North, uh, uh, Northwest, whatever. And I'm going to, I want to ask a question, have it return that information to me from the business system in a Q&A centric way. They just went live with that. So cool. Um, check them out. So can I set those clear expectations? Are my employees, do my employees indicate that AI, that the availability of AI agents creates definitive efficiencies for them? This is not, am I turned on? It's, do I indicate I'm getting value? Am I seeing efficiencies? So if I have someone enabled for Copilot, for example, and they're delegating activities to Copilot, prepare this presentation or um, give me the, the outcome of this particular meeting and summarize the action items. Are they able to measurably show that they're getting real efficiencies from that? Or have I not achieved that because I haven't maybe trained them well or I haven't, I've just been dinking around with it. Um, have I gone through that channel? Do I have a new revenue stream that's been created by using AI driven information? This is truly about, can I use data that I know about my customers to create new revenue? So for example, I have a customer that, they sell food products, and those food products have extremely low margin, but they're in every restaurant. You know what they really know? They know everything about the restaurant business. One of the highest uh, turnover, one of the highest areas of failure is restaurant businesses, but they know a lot about what makes successful restaurants. They can use that information to be able to sell. You're in the top quartile because this is what you do really. This is what the top quartile does well. Here's how you adjust to be in that top quartile. How do I use data to be able to be a new revenue stream or asset to create higher margin activities with my customers. Um, have I found unintuitive insights into production processes that have been discovered? I was working with a company, um, they, they happen to uh, produce, a high, uh, produce uh, batteries. So what they learned was there is, a, there was like this unknown part of their production process. They were use, able to use AI to discover Essentially, why they have this variability within their production, they're able to achieve normal, normal, normalcy of that production by what they learn from the OT data. Kind of like the, I've heard of the OT data be like the undiscovered country, right? Like it's out there. I've never used it. How do I use that information to be able to be able to learn something about my my process? <clears throat> so all these things, okay. This is what many companies have achieved. How do we take this forward? So my question is, where are you on this process? So meaning, where are you? So in the start of this, you have to start with that mapping, that envisioning and strategy. Think about this step one, right? I need to know how I'm going to marry the mission of my business, the strategy behind it, and using AI to force multiply those goals. Have I thought about that at the executive level? And that bubbled down into the prioritize alignment. And that's not just, a lot of people think about this just in terms of use cases. It's not just about use cases. It's about thinking about what the possible future is and working backward from that possible future to be able to translate that into action. And not all of those actions are going to work. And we'll talk more about that later. This, this creating this culture of innovation is not about like this one thing. It's about translating that strategy into action and scaling across my organization. That then measurable results, we need to measure it. We need to prove it. We need to show it actually happens and then scale that within the context of our business. I venture that, that many of you are probably still here, but if you're not, I'd love to understand where you are on the channel so we can start to talk about how we get you there. So to start that part of the conversation, I wanna kind of make it just a general statement. You probably heard the 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 statement the hardest the hardest company to disrupt is your own. Maybe you've heard it in the context of yourself, like the hardest person to disrupt is yourself. Like it's always hard for us to turn inward and to uh, accept something that may be true about us ourselves uh, or to change our own actions. Same thing with companies. The hardest company to disrupt is your own, particularly if it is already making money. <laughs> companies. Are, I was at a, a fantastic talk last week that kind of hearkened to Clayton Christensen's ideas, which is essentially that 
enterprise organizations, they drive toward efficiency and they get really good at it. But what they aren't really great at is disrupting that efficiency to create new business models that may not exist today. So they may be really good at this incremental innovation, which a lot of times when you look at the things that you're trying to do in your business, you think of like, well, you know, here's a process I do today. Can I replace that with AI? And that's not bad. That's just like you're optimizing an existing process. But what some companies need to do is they have to say, what's the possible future that could exist in my market space that I'm not harnessing today? And what needs to be true for me to achieve that goal? And then in looking at that, you start thinking about what are the jobs to be done, not only from our organization, but for my customers that I can serve more effectively. Do I need, for example, I was working with a company that distributes like uh, a commodity. Do I need to quote my customers this or can they quote themselves? And what would need to be true for them to quote themselves? And how would I enable them to get the best price and have certainty that they would get the best price if they quoted themselves? What would happen? What would need to be true for that to, for that to occur? Thinking about jobs to be done, enable that to happen. And this really then drives us to this idea of these co-innovation paths, this idea of sustained innovation that you're always going to be doing to run your business and disruptive innovation, which is essentially dis disrupting, right? It's enabling your business to look at the market in a way which is different than it does today. I'll talk more about that in a minute. So this is this tension, okay? So imagine yourself and imagine your competitor. Yourself, you have this revenue and you have a tug of war with competitive forces against your competitor. And you see here that as you gain efficiencies, you gain more in that competitive force against your competitor, whatever that percentage of market is. Let's say this is per 50% of the available market that's spread between you and your competitor, or maybe even smaller, like I was working with this company. They, they're like the leading company in the world, but they only own like 8% of the overall market. Like it's like, you're nowhere close to a monopoly, but you, you're, you're the biggest company in the world. So there's a tug of war and these efficiencies that you're trying to drive. This is where you're, you're applying AI and other tools to grab, grab these efficiencies. Maybe that's like even the auto quoting situation, you're just trying to help like get more of that pie. But what probably exists is this unharnessed opportunity that neither of you are getting today. What would need to be true for me to harness that opportunity? What would need to be true for me to use technology to be able to change the way I engage that market? And sometimes it means less features, less capabilities, a different way of engaging, but a broader market that I can that I can garner today. So maybe I'm a two billion dollar company today, but the overall market opportunity is forty billion dollars. How do I get more of that forty rather than fighting for the two I have right now? Or how do I do both? How do I keep garnering that that two, but then go after the forty as a new opportunity? This is where people who are being successful are thinking. They're thinking about both of those those ideas. So if we go into this idea now of what works and what doesn't, we're going to do a little bit of an A, B and between each of those. So what works and what doesn't? Business alignment. What doesn't work is IT by itself isolated on use cases. IT is really good at coming up with use cases in a vacuum, right? Like if you gave IT... Uh, the opportunity to go after AI, they come up with their big list and maybe they share it with the business and they try to go after some. But what happens is it becomes too siloed. It becomes IT's objective, not the business's objective. You need to make sure the business is driving those AI objectives and are the number one supporter behind why they are being pursued. The most successful AI initiatives have been there, been, been successful because the business cared about them even more than the tech organization did. And this is by enabling the priorities being mapped to the business, by having an AI upscaling campaign, and by having a direct experimentation culture that's accepting, not just accepting a failure, it's, ex it's expecting failure and looking to what they can learn from those moments. How can I have lines in the water, realize Oh, there's no fish in that hole. I'm not going to fish there again. I'm going to, or I needed to use a different fly on my rod because that particular, like that hole's got, that's a good place. There's, it's deep. It's, there's, there's still water, but I need to use a different type of lure for it to uh, desire to hit that particular, um, particular uh, 
pass that I did, right? But I need to be able to react to those moments and expect failure and be able to have the resiliency to be able to take those next steps. So you need to be able to have a uh, ability to create and validate alignment to the business and understand what's there and understand the, the opportunities that exist before you. So this is a this is an example of that for like software digital uh uh, software digital platforms company. So this idea of thinking about what are the things we do? What are the categories? What are the names? What are the descriptions? Where is it going to impact our business? And then even how hard is it? Like I might not go after the moonshot opportunity on day one. I might go after some some lower, like lower capability type of things to get my feet wet, to experiment, to get some quick wins. But that's not to distract me from this idea that I'm building muscle to attack the goal. The, the failure is when companies think of going after the quick win as end in itself. Like that is that is a start. That's like a uh, if that's like your AI strategy, you're missing this idea of like how am I going to engage the business and measure and transform. And in two years, I can look back and say I really did something. So starting with this a map, but then getting to a point where I'm following through on it in multiple lanes, but then still picking some picking some that are really focused on achieving measurable outcomes. So this pairs with this idea of co-innovation. In co-innovation, what doesn't work is all AI efforts ride on that single use case success. So if you go back to that previous slide and you pick one, you're like, this is the one we're going after. And that one kind of hits a roadblock. You're like, oh, like that did not get to where I needed to get to. Oh, I'm sorry, AI is a failure because that specific use case didn't get to where it needed to get to. That's that's really like underfunding, underengaging, underscaling the idea of how we're going to pursue AI within our organization. Don't put all your eggs on one basket. Don't think that just because one work use case is not going to be successful or needs to pivot, that suddenly you are going to um, not see value from AI. This is where we need to see value in experimentation. We need to be comfortable with this idea of reacting to what's happening within the market, being able to continually see that this innovation is happening outside and inside our organization, creating that culture where we build team momentum versus this one and done, long game versus short game. Now that also doesn't mean we just tinker, right? Like I've seen some companies like, um, you can see some companies they, they put a lot of value in, and it sort of rides or dies on that one big thing. I've seen the flip side, tons of energy on innovation, but none of it really gets to production, right? Because that that culture of innovation isn't paired with the stick to of pushing things out of that experimentation into a uh, production use case or into like a channel that gets to production. So I'm gonna pause here for a second and ask another question. And I think this is a really important question for all of us to ask ourselves. Can this be a moment where every person can be the best version of themselves, where we enable them to be that? And I ask that question because in every major technology movement, there are winners and losers. There are people uh, who are impacted. There are individuals who receive the benefits and those that are uh, sort of, in a sense, uh, can be taken advantage of, unfortunately, to receive those benefits. You saw that with the Industrial Revolution, right? There was a transition from point A to point B. You saw a dramatic improvement in the sort of general, like, populace's uh, ac accessibility of, of goods, right? Like, we could produce more of the same amount of people. We could produce more outcome. We can enable more uh, more economic GDP, if you look at the hockey stick that happened after electrification and the industrial revolution and then travel, um, you saw dramatic changes. But you also know that there was dramatic changes to the way people worked in those scenarios. You had people who were in these sort of factory settings that weren't treated appropriately. You also saw that in something we all probably lived through is the advent of the smartphone or just simply having a smartphone, getting your first smartphone. What does that mean to us? Like, how did that change the way we work? We know that if I had, like, knowing what I know today, what would I tell someone who's getting a smartphone for the first time? How do I prevent them from having the same kind of, like, addictive qualities that maybe I have with a smartphone that I don't want them to have? Do we just let that happen to us, or do we lead through it? This is a moment for us to lead through it, to know that every person in your organization is going to be using AI in some capacity. How do we enable them to be able to 
have the skills to function in this new world of work. And that goes with scaling, okay? So when you think about scaling an AI engagement, you think about, is my AI strategy just to enable a small team and then everybody else just keep doing what you're doing? Or is it to understand that I have diverse lanes of AI engagement across my organization that enables various types of capabilities and engagement that are centric to the type of user. So for example, I might have individuals in my organization that are um, just, they're information workers, right? They're doing all sorts of work all day long and they're on all these calls, right? How can I enable them with say Copilot for them to record those calls and capture action items and then not have to spend their time manually typing all that, right? Like how can I amp up how they work? How can I enable my factory workers to have access to a, a Q and A agent that enables them to get their HR questions answered faster, or to um, be able to participate in the culture of the organization in a different way? This is about scaling and encouragement, engaging a broad group, challenges and hackathons, executive buy-in. This is if your executive team isn't talking about this and it's just an IT thing, you've missed it. This is about scaling across the organization. You might say like, like. Okay, like I realize we're going to hit this trough of missed expectations and so on. Like, how does that, how's that going to impact us? Realize that this is same thing with the smartphone, same thing with the internet, right? You're going to have this like channel that happens, this like ups and downs throughout this transformation, but it will dramatically change everyone's work. And your leaders are going to be excellent leaders if they work, if they move through that channel in a way that enables every person to be able to be more. And especially that rounds out the curve, doesn't have quite as high of a high, doesn't have quite as low of a low, and enables you to be able to get that broad engagement. Engagement meaning like everyone feels they're on the bus. Everyone feels they're on the boat rowing in the same direction and not left on the shore being left behind. And that means follow through. That means uh, what doesn't work in follow through is when you have that small effort and you get that cold feet. So I had a, a, a customer that or have um, they had something like 500 something salespersons. We built an auto quoting engine for them. And initially they released that auto quoting engine. We knew it worked. And you had the salespeople and they're like, oh, I don't know. I mean, I'm faster doing it myself or uh, I'm I'm not sure how to use it. And that VP of sales could have been like, ah, oh, whatever, just, just adopt what you want to adopt. It'll be fine, you know, or maybe I won't follow through on this. Um, and I had the same thing with like a customer service scenario where it was like, it was answering some of the questions well, wasn't answering them all well. And it's like, well, yeah, maybe it's not successful. You need to have the follow through. These efforts are going to POC. You're going to see initial success. You're going to see edge cases where these things don't work or if major cases where they don't work. And you have to have organizational follow through both on the adoption side and the business and in the development side and building solutions to bring it all the way through the um, the, the channel of, of adoption. So ultimately that 500 salesperson organization adopted this across the entire organization. And one of the biggest benefits they received from that was it leveled up everyone. Someone who's been there 20 years and someone who's been there five weeks have a lot of the same assets now available to them in creating this level playing field of how they can engage their customers. Basically, the average ability to engage a customer went up because they were able to take advantage of AI that brought that to the table. So commitment on follow through is a critical capability to enable you to be successful. So another pause, I think this is another really important point and it's almost important as understanding the mission of the business and enabling a person to be the best version of themselves. If you translate that down, I want you to remember that we are currently under hyping AI upskilling. We're under hyping AI upskilling and impact. And you can say, whoa, we're under hyping something? Like AI is pretty hyped right now. We are under hyping it. And the reason why I know we're under hyping it is you have to look at the actions of the organizations as though they are living what they believe to be true. Does your organization truly believe, like truly believe in their heart that like AI is going to change the nature of the work that they do? Like there's a hurricane coming. I got to get out of the way, right? I got to get out of town. If I don't believe that that's going to have that impact, I'm not getting out of town, right? It might hit me anyway, you know, but I, 
if I understand that that's a threat and I need to move, I'm going to get out of town. We need to understand that this is not only a threat, it's an opportunity, and it's something that is going to impact every person in your organization. The organizations that are skilled and capable with AI tools are going to be tremendously more effective than those that are not. Even just commodity by itself, the ones that are able to use that well are going to be tremendously more effective simply because it takes less time to do anything that they need to do. I was working with a company uh, over the last couple of weeks and um, I uh, I was uh, starting on their like idea registry. And you know what I did? I went out to uh, I went out to Copilot. And I said, uh, here's their website. Here's my old registries. Index that website and give me a table of scenarios that align to their functional towers, categories, and return on investment associated with them. And I got a great starter list out of that. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't what I was going to show to them ultimately, um, but it got me going, right? And you know how much that helped me? Immense, immense, because it allowed me to be able to make intentional changes and not spend time on the busy work. So what is that? What's required to enable that? It's upskilling. And what doesn't work is not acting like AI is going to be transformative. It is transformative. It is going to change the very nature of work. And that requires a dedicated and substantial upskilling process. And it particularly reminds you that this is not about technology skills. It's about growth mindset. So about every person in your organization having to challenge themselves of what they do today and how those tasks will be replaced and changed in the future and how their work will be augmented by AI agents. You're seeing the infancy. Remember, we're at like Internet 1.0 right now of what this means. You're seeing the infancy of the delegation to AI agents. And a lot of it is like, give me information back. It's moving to go do something for me. It's like having an intern next to you that just started and you're having to understand their skill set and know what they can do and not do. Like I have my my son power washing my deck um, and then staining my deck, right? I, I had to teach him how to power wash the deck. And as he improved his skills, I could better delegate that activity to him. Same thing with like the staining process, right? Like as he better understood the skills and how to do it, he could better delegate. This is what's happening with AI agents. As we're better able to collaborate and communicate, understand the capabilities of the AI agent, build the AI agent's capability to be able to be delegated to, it gets better and better. But this is where AI enablement skills come in really, really importantly. They become part of the nature of how we execute on the work that we're doing. So as we move from this idea of what works and what doesn't work, I want to give you some flavor of how companies are tackling some of these important objectives with really well-structured um, sort of development frameworks. And one of the ways that we've been thinking about this is a lot of the AI pursuits, it's it's not all that different in software development or adoption, right? If you're, we've had to adopt things in the past, but now we're adopting something really substantial. Like it's like if you said the smartphone's going to drop tomorrow, this is going to be impactful to you. And people would get their first smartphone and they're like, ah, I remember my first smartphone it was like the palm 3c it was like the color version of the palm and i was like this is so cool but i was like the only person walking around with that palm um i was tracking my help desk tickets on it now it's, everyone's got it right but if if you told someone then this is going to change this is going to rock your world you're not going to in fact you're going to be addicted to this thing they brought they probably look at you and be like why really like i'm not going to carry that thing around like that's for that's for geeky people i'm not going to do that like this is this is that same kind of level of thing so how do I think about this in the context of like building these kinds of solutions? So really what this means is you're doing something hard. You're doing something complex. Let's talk about, about what that is. So if we had to say, what do the winners do well? What do the winners do well? The first things they do well is they do really rigorous problem selection. They pick the right things, small, internal, AI friendly, they're looking for replacing bad existing solutions. They're looking for opportunities that are, are um, clear, the ones that stick out, the ones that business is willing to, su to support, and they're following through on. But they have a belief that failure is good, and that's a hard thing to say. Like, failure is good because we can react to it. And they're pragmatic about what's going on, and they're, they're willing to stop and start and move and shift and focus on the things that are going to be the right 
objectives. And then in execution, they think about this being an engineering activity and engineering in different ways, right? So we have the adoption lane. We have this idea of like low code, no code. You're seeing that with wait, co Copilot Wave 2, for example, where you see these like agentic AI scenarios start to pop out. And then as you get to your big, your big, hairy, audacious AI solutions that support your business in uh, like these huge follow throughs, this is this idea of products, not projects, products, not projects. This idea of I'm creating product teams that enable me to be able to support the objectives of the organization and they're able to react to the needs of the business. They're not just spinning up like one time projects to be able to respond to something. Um, projects sometimes are too static, they're too static for us to be able to really uh, be successful at as an organization. So um, I think it's important to think about once your business like starts to tackle an objective and this is centric to building them. OK, so if you think about those three lanes, especially on the like high build scenarios where you'll probably be going, going after some really important objectives, a lot of companies, they think of like, OK, you're going to go build an ML system. What is that made up of? They're, what they think of is like, I've got a data scientist and they're using generative AI or they're using something else and they're creating this ML code. And that's it's true. There is ML code. There is the the the, the capabilities of the um, the machine learning system, the generative AI system that we're building. But then surrounding that are all these other things. And that's where the idea of like the data I'm using or the serving infrastructure of how I bring it to my customers. Like, am I, am I building this from scratch or am I creating a, a power app or am I building in Copilot Studio? Am I uh, doing it in a you know, self-service kind of way? Um, is there a, a model valida validation process? Have I enabled, for example, Microsoft's uh, AI safety and security layer that's looking for different types of compromises against my AI systems? How am I monitoring that to validate that that continues to be true? Um, especially if I launch and land a AI agent that my customers are interacting with. Have I built the right layers between that customer and the information, the business system that sits behind that AI tool? So building AI systems becomes very rigorous. And especially when you're thinking about um, you're thinking about creating systems for your customers directly or that your customer service or sales or engineering teams are using to be able to serve your customers, you need to think about it rigorously. It's very much is a software development exercise. And then below that exists the data and exists the infrastructure and exists the capabilities. So when you think about building AI solutions, underneath an AI solution is essentially software engineering that sits on the data and sits on the availability of the cloud. Why I bring this up is so many organizations have been, you know, starting to dabble in the cloud, starting to leverage the cloud for different purposes. And the organizations that didn't do the work up to this point to get themselves ready, skilling wise, capability wise, data wise, they're going to be behind. They're going to be challenged to be able to take advantage of the data and the availability of the cloud and some of the muscle memory of software engineering to land AI capabilities within their organizations in the build lane because they haven't done the homework ahead of time. And you could think about that outside of the build lane in the adoption lane in this way. Imagine you have a family member who does not have significant technology skills, okay? Like just in their personal life. Just think about, like I think about uh, one of my family members that like still struggles with their smartphone, still calls you with every question. Maybe they still call the airline rather than online booking, right? Like there's like, there's these, they just don't get it, right? They didn't live through it. They they struggle with the technology today. They haven't been able to make the pivot. And they're just at that point. Maybe it's your grandmother. Maybe it's your mother. Maybe it's your sister, you know, whoever it is, right? Or your, your brother. We're going to live through that moment right now. And those of us that are getting access to these tools and are growing along with it, or in digital native land, and we just adopted because it always existed as part of our life, are going to take advantage of these tools really quickly. But we're going to have a set of people whose businesses drag their feet, aren't engaged, they don't think it's going to be a thing, and they get left behind. And they won't have done the homework. 
So they'll get to a point five years from now and they'll get an AI agent on their desk when they go to the new job. And they'll be like, how do I use this thing and how do I interact and what should I do? And it's going to be it's going to feel so foreign because they're not used to delegating to an AI agent the same way another person might be very comfortable. So one of the things that's on us is to do the homework, right? So in the build lane, it's about getting all this ready, picking the right solutions to, to deliver on AI. But in the adoption lane, it's about how do I bring my people along for this ride and enable them in a culture of innovation that helps them be, to be successful. So when you're building these systems, you're always looking at opportunities to de-risk. So what we do is we divide them into three different pieces. You have a proof of concept phase where you're just doing the minimum capabilities necessary to, to validate the scenario actually works. Like, will this work? You know, let's ask that, answer that question first. Like, can I get here from here? Can I get there from here? But then you get to a point where you're then building a minimum viable product. And minimum viable products, as many of you are aware, is the minimum product to deliver value the minimum product to deliver value in some way. And, and that also is like missing some elements because you're not going to overinvest until you're actually delivering value. Um, you're, you're getting into a point where you're like, you can test it out on X number of customer scenarios or X number of use cases and validate it's doing what, not only can it do it, but like, does it do it in a pract in practicality way? Remember that thing I said, pragmatic? Like, does this pragmatically do what I, I need it to do? which then leads us to this idea of machine learning operations in building this operational resiliency into everything I create. And this, and this is one of the things that many companies leave off. Going back 10 years in the AI space, I've seen organizations build you know, ML models for, machine, for forecasting of their supply chains, but have really weak resiliency on the phase three capabilities, really weak resiliency on how the machine learning operations is built in the context of their operational state. So if something breaks, they put the wrong data in, or they're not even evaluating the data, all those surrounding components become too brittle. And by the time it gets pushed into production, that guy leaves or the wrong data gets pushed in. This isn't, this is a production service. I need to have that resiliency that exists here. And this is why follow through is so important, but also constant evaluation is so important to uh, to this this channel. So this is a phase comparison of what elements are going to exist in each. You can see this a little bit. This is a good one to screen capture. You can see the POC leaves off with just those first couple components, but then the MVP and the ML ops start to build on that as you're creating that muscle memory and as you're getting it further into the, the deployment process. Why this is important is this is not just important. If you go back to that, um, that arrow of adoption, this is not just important in the context of building a solution. It's important in governing what's necessary to be in production within our organizations. So as you look at creating your artificial intelligence center of excellence or you know, steering group, um, that steering group has to have responsibility not only to ensure that enablement is happening, and especially ensure enablement is happening in the right ways against the context of the business, both in the commodity lane and the sort of buy lane, like I'm buying AI solutions and adopting them, or in the lane of building AI solutions, whether it's low code, no code, or it's some of the things we're talking about here, that that governance exists. And that's always a balance. You can't govern something that doesn't exist. And you can't, it, adopting something without governance is a mistake, right? It's like a it's like a road with no speed limits. Sometimes it can be okay, but most of the time you need a speed limit somewhere. You need some signs, right? Just to keep us going in the right directions, to pause at the right places, to enable us to be highly aware, to have the right traffic patterns. All of that matters to us being, uh, being very successful in creating AI systems. So as you're driving toward using and adopting AI systems or building them, it's important to know where it exists on the channel, like on the site, like the, the range of uh, capability of AI that exists uh, that we might be adopting. So on the far left-hand side, you can see this idea of <clears throat> no AI. Okay, no AI simply meaning that like, well, duh, we're, not, we're not using AI for anything, right? And it gets to AI as a tool that 
um, we're able to automate simple tasks. We're able to like, I kind of feel like this is like where um, many of the AI solutions had been in the public space for, for some time now. It's like, okay, cool. I'm like, I'm creating an image or I'm, I'm, it's responding with some content. I'm, I'm getting a, a optimized um, sentence from Grammarly, you know, I'm, I'm, it's a tool. It's providing me with an asset to do something, but it's not, um, it's not boosting me above that, right? It's not, it's not moving me past what my ask initially is. Which then moves to this idea of AI as a consultant, this idea that um, it's, it's not only doing something I've asked it to do, but it's, it's kind of taking the next step beyond that and saying, did you think of, did you do X? Did you, uh, it's providing recommendations back based upon a body of knowledge. And that's still more on the person than it is on the AI tool, but you can see it's a next step beyond the tool, right? The, it's asking the next question. It's in, it's infusing knowledge beyond what it was initially asked. But where we're going to arrive at is this idea of AI as a collaborator, okay? AI as a collaborator, which is this, this idea of AI and humans playing equal roles within the process, and they're bouncing ideas off of the other. You've seen the infancy of this with reasoning systems, the infancy of this with um, some of the custom systems that have been built, they play this complementary path within the channel. Getting then to this idea of AI as an expert, AI controls tasks and uses human for feedback and input, and they can execute those simple subtasks, but they are the expert, they're the one providing. So if you look at this in like terms of supply chain, this might be, uh, you know, no, zero is no supply chain tool. One might be, I now have an AI supply chain tool that is going to give me information um, about my, my um, predicted demand. It's not prescribing something yet, but it's giving me predicted demand, okay? As a consultant, might predict what I should do about it, right? So it says, it's not just predicting the demand, it's saying, here's the inventory you should buy based upon the, uh, the prediction of the, of the needed demand, right? So it's like taking the next step. Um, and then AI as a collaborator might be like, it's going to bounce off the, the, the potential uh, possibilities for the future. Let's talk about what could change here or here or here or here based upon that, that idea. AI as an expert is almost it coming back to the business and functioning as its own agency within the context of the organization. Saying the, the AI agent is the A to my B on the, uh, the supply chain uh, the supply chain challenge, right? It's recommending back. It's saying, this is what we now understand. I would re recommend doing this business. You make these choices, but it does so with more agency than the tool or the consultant, right? It has the agency and it's simply asking for permission in a sense. And autonomous AI is really like, it's completely on its own. Think about this as like truly self-driving cars. Do we get to a state where we have truly self-driving cars at some point? Um, that would be an example of autonomous AI. Why is that so important? It's extremely expensive. It's extremely expensive right now to build autonomous AI. Realize that most of the things you build are going to be in this space, um, maybe eventually getting to here, short term at least. These are the spaces you're building in. That's okay. The difference between that and no AI is substantial. What a cool graphic. Okay, so where do we go from here? Um, where we go from here is I want you to take action and I want to, you to realize where you are on that channel. You may already be taking action. You may already have your ideas. You may already have know how to map that, or maybe you don't. So the ways that we help with this channel is a couple of different things. We help by doing executive AI envisioning. I do this all the time. Our team is, does it all the time. The, uh, the results of this are substantial. This is the spot to engage us, to help you to get going on the journey in the appropriate ways, to help engage your executive team, to help understand what ideas are working, which ideas won't. We've got, seriously, we have so much background now on what ideas are good ideas and which ideas are not. Simply that by itself is helpful as you're starting to do that exploration because there's some that just simply work some that simply are challenged to work based upon the capabilities that exist today. So that's a great area for us to engage right at the start is executive AI envisioning. The second is if you're going down the lane of commodity adoption, especially Copilot, they just released Copilot Wave 2. Um, we have a readiness workshop for that. We have an adoption program that's 
uh, that's very provable in terms of its ability to drive success. We're working with organizations all the way up to very highly regulated customers, as well as non-regulated, kind of anywhere in that space, around M365 Copilot adoption. Um, if you are thinking about going down the, the lane of, of Copilot adoption, we are a great company to work with there. Um, and then the third is this idea of like chatbot use case exploration, this idea of like, I'm just, I'm looking to think about not only what I should build, but I'm, maybe I'm in the middle of building it. Like we are, uh, interestingly enough, some very highly regulated chatbot scenarios have come to our table recently that we're helping companies collaborate with. I can't give you the details of them, um, but some amazing use cases. Um, not it's, it, I, I'd even expand it beyond chatbot to be the idea of just an AI agent that's performing an activity within your environment. So, so many opportunities for next steps. I would love for you as you're leaving today to do two things. And we're going to get to questions, by the way. Um, if As you're leaving today, I want you to fill out the survey. Please select one of those and give me feedback. I want to know what you loved about the session, what you didn't love about the session, <laughs> what uh, what we can do better, what we can't do better. Um, give me that feedback. I want to hear it. I want to know it. I want to be able to react to um, what you're learning and not learning um, so we can do more. These next sessions are other sessions coming from our um, our in-person events. So why you shouldn't invest in Gen AI. Um, this is a great session. Brandon's going to do a great breakdown of just like how to even have a decision matrix. How do I choose what to do versus not to there? And then uh, on the 24th, we're going to get into next gen agents, which is comparing Semantic Kernel, which is one of the AI agent infrastructures, um, and Copilot Studio, which is a low code, no code uh, vehicle for building AI agents that you're already seeing light up in M365 Copilot as well. Um, that is a very interesting session, tons of value in that as well. So both of those are going to be worth your time. Make sure you sign up for them. Um, they're on our website uh, right now. Okay. I promised you I'd take some time for questions. Um, I would love to answer them now. So I'm going to go check out the Q and A in chat there, and we'll see what is uh, see what is there. Give me a moment. Okay. Oh well, I thank you for the screen thing. I see that. Okay. Um, I don't see anything yet, but if anybody wants to add any questions, we still have a few minutes. All right. I will just chill. Um, mm -hmm. Please drop them in there if you have questions. I'm I am here for you. Would love to answer them. Okay, that means you learned everything. And I'm so happy about that. Um, but if you didn't and you want to have more conversations and we would love to as well please fill out the form um and we'd love to talk to you after the session is over yes exactly thank you mark uh, we're now ai experts um please fill out the form we'd love to chat with you i'd love to connect with you hit me on linkedin um and let's uh, let's go on to next steps and talk more about this so i'm just thrilled that you spent some time with us and uh, looking forward to more have a great afternoon and great day and we'll see you soon